on the mound, and so is Chris Volstad, and that would be a strike, says Country Joe West, to Juan Pierre, of course, a, a fan favorite here from 03 through 05, three seasons, three marvelous seasons as a Marlin, and Pierre thrust into the lineup in the absence of Manny Ramirez. Well, the thing with Juan Pierre, too, you, you don't uh, want to waste a whole lot of pitches because he's not going to strike out. 60 at-bats, he's only struck out once. You hope he hits a ground ball at somebody, but he is the beneficiary of Manny Ramirez suspension. And JP has gotten in the lineup, has played every game in left field since. Pierre doesn't walk much, he doesn't strike out much. But when he gets on base, he can really run. Ooh, just missed. Volstead thought he caught the corner, and it's two and two. Pierre last year. Hit 283 and swiped 40 bases and was not uh, in the lineup every day last year. He was kind of one of the odd men out as the Dodgers made their run to win the National League West with an 84 and 78 record. Here's the 2 2 pitch. It's up and it's 3 and 2. Joe Torrey. Has led a team into the postseason now 13 consecutive seasons. He's one shot of Bobby Cox's all time record. Pierre puts it in the air. That's Cody Ross out there tonight. He makes the catch. All right, just in case you were wondering who the rest of the defense is, we'll give you a look. Chris Coughlin gets his first start at home in left field. Jeremy Hermida in right. Bonifacio, Ramirez, Ugla, and Kentu. Around the infield and with the lefty on the mound, Ronnie Paulino is handling Chris Volstead. Volstead at two and two, start number eight tonight. And here is Rafael for call. He runs up to bunt, drops it down, third base side. It's going to trickle, 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 staying fair, and it just goes foul. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Bonifacio. <laughs> you know, you have to make that quick decision. And he realized at one point in time, if he picks it up, he's not going to throw off for call. So then he just let it go. All right. They hit the, hit the little pebble. It's fair. It's fair. And it just misses the bag. <laughs> oh, well, it turns out to be a great decision by Emilio Bonifacio. And so the count is 0 and 1 to for call. Now, obviously, Rich, a, a different look with the Dodgers, and we'll talk about this with uh, with the Manuelist Dodgers because Joe Torre has loaded his speed at the top of the order with Pierre for call and Orlando Hudson hitting in the third spot. 0 2. Yeah, many people have said, well, what are the Dodgers going to do without Manny? But you look at this lineup, it is filled with accomplished big leaguers, all stars, guys like for call. And Hudson and Russell Martin, young studs like Ethier, Loney, Kemp, a grizzled veteran like Casey Blake, Juan Pierre. I mean, they're not wanting for offense right now. They've got plenty of pop in their lineup. Left field, Coglin a long run, and Bonifacio is there as well. And they're two outs. Boy, nice play by Bonifacio. Long way to go. He shows his quickness and his ability just to turn over that left shoulder. That's not an easy play. And was able to track it down. I tell you what, a lot of third basemen don't get to that ball. I agree. All right, here is Hudson. He has been one of the best free agent signings so far in baseball. And for not a lot of money, $3 million, that's what uh, Hudson signed for. Coming off of two injury shortened years at Arizona, late injuries in 07 and 08. And he's done plenty of digging in the batter's box, getting ready for this AB. The O Dog has hit in five straight, and he had six hits in Philadelphia, where the Dodgers took two of three from the Phillies. The a lot of people were afraid of that wrist injury. That Hudson had and afraid to sign him, not knowing if it was going to be healthy. So far, it's been more than healthy. 342 average. 
Goes after the high heat, it is two and one. He adds something that the Dodgers didn't have last year, and that's great range at second base. Jeff Kent's last year was last year. He retired after the season. Hudson, not the run producer that Kent is. That's a strike. But a gold glover defensively, a high energy guy. Completely different type player, yeah. Look at he's out of the batter's box. No wonder he was digging. He's on the other side of that line. Somebody ought to point that out to Joe West. Here's the 2 2. That's on the outside corner. Joe West said, Take a seat. Captain Chris Bolstad said, Stand wherever you want. <laughs> One, two, three, go the Dodgers. Here's the Dodgers defensively. Juan Pierre, Matt Kemp, Andre Ethier out there in the outfield with Blake and Loney on the corners. Hudson and Fercal up the middle. And it's a good defense. One of the uh, real improvements of this ball club, and they've played a solid defense all year. So Eric Stoltz, all of 29 years, will stand in with a good record and a great outing his last time out. A four-hit shutout of the Giants. And try to continue that as he throws one by Bonifacio. You know, he's had 20 major league starts and he's thrown two shutouts. That won the last time out. He threw one last year at Dodger Stadium against the White Sox in interleague play. Bonifacio, Chris Coughlin, and Hanley Ramirez in the bottom of the first inning. Stoltz. Would qualify as a soft tossing lefty. Bonifacio pops it up. And he's a soft tossing lefty that gets righties out better than he gets lefties out. Well, the Marlins in back to back games are going to see a couple of soft tossers. Eric Milton is pitching uh, tomorrow for the Dodgers. A little harder throwing left hander on Sunday and Clayton Kershaw. But Bonifacio started to swing the bat well, I thought, on the road trip right now, working on a six game. Hitting streak too. Yeah, seven for 21 on that trip. There's the soft stuff, and it's two and two. Those are his trip numbers. That one just missed. Martin tried to snap it back. Although Orlando Hudson is probably muttering to himself out at second base that that was a strike when he was up there. Yeah, especially with the view he has from second base. <laughs> Three two. Smacked up the middle into center field base hit. Bonifacio is a goal. Yeah. 
So the leadoff man is aboard. Here's the Marlins lineup. Bonifacio followed by the rookie Chris Coglin getting his first home game in. Hanley Ramirez, Jorge Cantu, Dan Ugla hits fifth, Jeremy Hermida in the sixth spot. Cody Ross behind him. That trio needs to get going right now. Ronnie Paulino gets to start against the lefty and Volstad hits ninth. I look for the left-handers tonight and Coglin and Hermida to actually have good at bats against Stultz. He doesn't have that nasty slider that is tough on a left-handed batter. And a move over to first and Bonifacio is back in. Well, lefties this year against Stoltz. Freddy Gonzalez looks on. Lefties have hit 314 against him. And righties have hit just 233. That's a pretty dramatic split. Mm -hmm. Coglin takes a strike. Chris Coglin, of course, made his major league debut on the road trip out of the Tampa area. An all SEC third baseman at Ole Miss. that pitch into the glove of Russell Martin it's 0 2 you know there are certain things the Dodgers have been doing well and why they have the best record in baseball in the month of May and this is an area that has been a concern for them in the month of May their starting pitchers have the best DRA in the major leagues 2.25. Which I think is a bit of a surprise when you take a look and see what they lost out of last year's rotation. Derek Lowe had been a stalwart in the rotation for a while. Brad Penny had an injury filled last year. Remember, Greg Maddox finished the season as a Dodger. Bonifacio breaks. Martin set up way outside. Stoltz hit the glove. But it's a ball. But the uh, former catcher Joe Torre and third baseman, he knows what a catcher can do trying to bring it back on the corner. Bonifacio at first. And Stoltz, a broken bat with the barrel rolling right by Stoltz and ending up behind the mound. Stoltz kept his confidence. Kept his concentration somehow and let the bat go right by him and picked up the ball. That's that's a great play. Boy, this is a severe jam shot, and it's not where the pitch was intended. Did you see where Martin was way outside? Look at how he has to reach all the way back to his back end. The pitch jams Coglin. And I'm not so sure Stoltz even saw the bat. He just looked at the ball, made the play. But in the meantime, Joe West does a little cleaning up, and Bonifacio's in scoring position. Now, Joe West is going to bring that bat over and hand it off. Major League Baseball still is studying the uh, breakage of bats, and in particular, the maple bats. And any bat that breaks like that is kept and studied as they continue to try to to try to uh, solve that problem. Now, the Marlins dug out with a few words. Just wanted to make sure they, they knew where that bat was going. Hanley steps in. Bonifacio is in scoring position, and there's one out. There are restrictions in place this year for Maple Bats, but Major League Baseball continues to study the problem. Hanley's hot 11 straight. Tough for Bonifacio to get a big lead because Hudson's not playing that far away from the bag. One of the things Hanley Ramirez has done very well this year is hit with runners in scoring position. Close to 500, 481. It's not an area where he excelled last year, especially when the Marlins moved him into the number three spot. In an experimental role. Yeah, and that was always the concern. The, the naysayers felt that he wasn't that type of hitter, but I think once he found out in spring training that that was where he was going to hit, it uh, changed things. And he's done a terrific job in that number three spot. 
They try to get in on him. Martin is as uh, active a catcher as you'll find, moving from side to side. And you can see most of his movement is late movement because he doesn't want to tip the pitch location to the runner out at second who might be able to relay it to the hitter. And sometimes hitters can hear or sense when a catcher's moving. And sometimes that movement can be a decoy, too. Up. They want it up and in. So far, Stoltz has shown very good control when he's gotten the target from Martin. Really, every pitch except that one he threw to Chris Coglin and jammed it. Bonifacio, a leadoff single. Hanley's behind in the count 0 and 2. Let's see where Russell Martin's headed on this one. Down and away. And it's in the dirt. It's 1 and 2. Now we talked about Orlando Hudson and how he's keeping Bonifacio close. Because he's so close there, there's a lot of room up there for Hanley. And we've seen him hit a number of balls to the right side and get base hits that way. One two. Got a piece. Martin holds it. Hanley strikes out. And up comes Cantu. Oh, Mikasuki brings you our weather. Mikasuki Resort in gaming. Come play our way. 81 degrees. Perfect. Great to be home. Marlins returning home after a stretch of 29 games, 22 of which were on the road. I tell you what, this is just great weather. It felt so good getting off the plane last night. Marlins in Colorado and Milwaukee on the last road trip. Cantu takes an off-speed pitch low, and it's 1-0. and Cantu has a big... RBI number and has been the big run producer for the Marlins, but struggled on the road trip, just three of 21. Last year at Dodger Stadium, Cantu and Hanley both had big series. That's the thing about Jorge Cantu. Even though he's had some struggles, he's managed to mix in some RBIs. And that a home run against Stoltz. During batting practice, he was mic'd up, and throughout the game, we'll give you the audio. Jorge Cantu during BP. Right now, he's behind in the count one and two. Bonifacio still out at second. Marlins trying to jump out in front. The Dodgers have been a great first inning team. All year long. Well, I think you see the way Stoltz likes to work. Number one, he's not afraid to pitch inside, even though he doesn't have a 90 mile an hour fastball. Big slow curveball. Haven't seen that yet. A lot of change ups, and he'll throw that anytime. But that mid 80s fastball is effective because he's not afraid to go inside. 2-2 pitch. Cantu got it off the end of the bat. For call, races out, calling for it. And in front of Pierre, he makes the catch. Marlins leave a runner out at second. We're underway and scoreless.
and he gets Andre Ethier, Russell Martin, and James Loney. A one, two, three first for Volstead. And here is Ethier. Everybody focused on the Manny Ramirez and that charge to the pennant last year. And certainly Manny made a big difference. But Ethier had a terrific September as well. He had 462 in September. Of course, Manny hit 396 in 53 games with the Dodgers. And certainly he had an impact on Ethier and the hitters around him. Yeah, he is uh, one of the hitters, the main one that has struggled. For the most part, Manny Ramirez was hitting third, and Ethier hit in the cleanup spot. So Joe Torre has kind of changed things, shuffled things a little bit, trying to get Ethier going. Good changeup. Ethier four for his last 35. Center field hit pretty well. Ross on the job and there. Marlins and Diamondbacks continue the homestand on Monday the 18th through Thursday the 21st. All four games at 7:10. Look at Tuesday's Miami Herald for the two for Tuesday coupon. 1877 Marlins or visit Marlins.com. Here is Russell Martin. Fourth year Dodger, two time All Star, won a gold glove in 2007. The Canadian catcher has been a terrific player. For the Dodgers in his brief career. Yeah, he got off to a little bit of a slow start. But all of a sudden, his last 11 games, Russell Martin's hit 486. They had a lot of guys that had a pretty good three game series in Philadelphia. Five for 11 was Martin. That's the type of ballpark where if you want to get your bats going, it's not a bad place to park yourself for three days. Even though it's not been friendly for a few of the Philly hitters. Tough start for Jimmy Rollins. The Phillies have scored first tonight against Washington. They lead it one nothing. Hottest hitter the Phillies have is still Raul Ibanez. Martin digs in, Volstad delivers. And it's three and two. Line shot, Ugla makes a catch. And so there's two outs. And here comes James Loney. Baseball fans, $250,000 Mustang money tickets go on sale on May 19th. Register from then until June 11th to win a 2010 Ford Mustang V6 convertible. It's the ultimate Florida baseball weekend giveaway or $100 gas cards. Visit FLALottery.com for details. Well, you know the one thing in watching Chris Volstad that he's been able to, to do is stay consistent. And you look at his starts, he's not allowed more than three earned runs in any of his seven starts this year. And by the way, I know you and I both talked to him. And there, there was concern when Josh Johnson left the game yesterday. He told both of us he's fine. And he'll be ready to go his next start. Which is the best news any Marlin fan could hear today. So Josh Johnson. A short start. One of the uh, theories. And Freddie was talking after the ball game. And it was something that Bobby Cox. And some of the brave starters. Hudson Smoltz guys experienced. Is their start after a start in Colorado. Oftentimes did not go well. 
Kolstad gets a comebacker and a 1 2 3 second as he gets Loney. We're scoreless. Park. Don't ask him about hitting in Milwaukee. He's all mic'd up. Something is off when I'm playing there. And it's only not only hitting. It's like it's overall. Yeah. It's overall. Yeah. By the way, I hate that ballpark. Everything about it. Milwaukee. Yes, everything. I've been going there for three years now, and I think only have two hits out of 30 chances. In that ballpark, I was looking at the stats yesterday. Just, just, just got very curious about it, because I never feel comfortable in that stadium for some reason. And sure enough, two out of thirty. <laughs> now, Cantu, not one of the uh, Marlins, spooked by the uh, ghosts in the Fister Hotel. Now, you know, going into that series, he was one for fourteen, and you know, it's it's a tough call. It's such a fine line. Half the battle is having confidence, and just the fact that he knows that is not good. <laughs> All right, here's a trio that could use a good shot of confidence. As Ugly goes after the first pitch, hits it to center field. Kemp is out there, and he makes the catch. With Hermida and Ross to follow now, Eric Stoltz into his second inning. But this threesome, who usually find themselves next to each other in the batting order, have really scuffled. Hermita stands in at 2.30. He was 3 for 18 on the road trip. Cody Ross was 2 for 17 on the trip. And as you pointed out, you can hide a couple of cold bats in the lineup, but when you've got a bunch of guys cold, it's tough to hide them. Yeah, and in this case, they're all in a row. Ugla, Hermita, and Cody Ross. And as we pointed out earlier, they, they are also guys who have struggled against left-handed pitching. Cody Ross comes into this game a 189 hitter against lefties. Jeremy Hermita, 184. Here's the 1-1. One, one. This is one lefty, though, that Hermita blasted in Los Angeles last year. This was Stokes, and this was Hermita. Yeah, and this is a guy that I think sometimes can bring a lefty out of a slump. So, as I said earlier, I think the lefties have a good chance to have some good swings tonight. Jim Presley working with Dan Ugla trying to bring him out of his funk. And Jeremy rips that in the gap right center field that ball's going to get. onto the warning track Kemp picks it up Hermita to second had Kemp not retrieved it before it hit the wall Hermita had a shot at a triple. He'll settle for a double. Well, there's a good example of what we were talking about. A nice swing by Jeremy Hermita against the left hander Eric Stoltz. Look where the pitch is. He misses. His fastball is up. Remember, it's about mid 80s, and it's our checkers double of the game. Jeremy found that gap in right center. And you're right. Kemp 
as we were told has been playing a very good defensive center field for the Dodgers has good speed if he doesn't cut it off the ball goes to the wall for me to probably gets to third. The Kemp in center Pierre in left Ethier in right. It's a pretty good speed out in the outfield Yeah, the Dodgers have a little more speed on their infield and on their outfield compared to last year. They're solid at third and Casey Blake. They have a gold glover at second. And the O dog we know for call how he can play short and James Loney is an above average first baseman. Here's Cody Ross now. And Ross takes down low. Cody's average hovering above 200. Marlins had a runner at second back in the first and left him there and Ross trying to yank one and that's one of the things rich that gets the right handers in trouble against the soft tossing lefties. You, you can't think yank you have to think Geico. <laughs> at least not until interleague play you have to think right center. And go from there. Cody Ross was a Dodger and a, uh, a Dodger farmhand for three years. There's there you got to think out in right center. There's that Geico sign. Ross waiting on a 2 1 pitch. And a strike. And Cody backs away. Stoltz evens the count at two and two. Cody originally drafted by the Tigers organization, traded to the Dodgers in 04, spent a couple seasons in Las Vegas, and played a total of 22 games in Dodger Blue. Two thousand and six was the year he started as a Dodger, played eight games. Had two home runs as a Dodger. Then he went to the Reds for two games, and then the Marlins got him. Pulls that one left field. Pierre over. And it makes the catch. Just got in on him enough. You could hear it. It didn't have that solid crack of the bat. And Stultz got away and made a pretty good pitch. Just enough inside. Cody had a pretty good approach, pretty good swing, but didn't get it on the, the meat of the bat. This should be a pretty good game of cat and mouse here. You've got Paulino who hits lefties well, but you've got first base open and the pitcher on deck. So let's see if he gets something to hit. Ooh, that squirted away. Up towards third base. Martin got there quickly. And Hermita at second. One and oh. If you're the runner at second, you have to make sure you're going to make it because you don't want to get thrown out at third. A couple of steps by Hermita, but then he saw, and you talked about how quick Russell Martin is behind the plate. Not so sure Ronnie's going to see much to hit here. So, as a hitter, do you try to go out of the zone or you just yeah, take is, your walk? Well, this is where if you're an experienced hitter and you're in that number eight spot, sometimes you might have to go a little bit out of the zone. Maybe guess backwards, you know, try to guess off speed. Now, after missing twice, they're just going to put him on. And that's why it's a, a tough spot to hit. We talked about it a lot with Cameron Maven when he was hitting in that number eight spot. That's why it's tough for a rookie to hit in that slot. If there's one ray of sunshine for the Marlins by facing a soft tossing lefty is he might be an easier pitcher to hit for a pitcher, a guy like uh, Chris Bolston. Oh, I think you see pitchers have pretty good swings against guys like this.
Not a lot of speed out there with Hermita at second and Paulino at first. And it's Volstad who stands in. Chris goes after the fastball. And basically what you're saying is sometimes a pitcher like this a soft tosser has uh, more stuff that'll go into the bat speed of a pitcher. Or you can't just throw it by a guy. Change up. He's got a good one. Oh and two. Joe Torrey. Year number two. And down goes Bolstad. Marlins leave a couple. They've left three in a scoreless game. Tomorrow. The start time is moved up for the Super Saturday. It's within the big Fox window. We cannot televise the game. We will have Sunday's game for you. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in high definition on Fox Sports Florida with the Diamondbacks in for a four game series. Freddy Gonzalez is our Geico quote of the Knights. We're not pretty to watch right now. It's just one of those stretches. Hopefully, a 10 day homestand will get us going again. Well, and I mentioned the the uh, homestands so far have been so quick that the Marlins really haven't had a chance and an opportunity. I don't think to, to settle in and the ball club just six and seven at home this year. Matt Kemp. Casey Blake and then Eric Stoltz Volstad has been efficient and sharp. Kemp one of the talented young Dodgers that uh, every year seems to get a little bit better. And he's still only 24. Breaks his bat and the awaits. Well, some nice pitches from Chris Volstad so far. I think one thing the Dodgers may see a little more of that they didn't see from Chris in that start last year in Los Angeles they may see more change ups. But a good uh, two seamer to saw off the bat of Matt Kemp. Casey Blake was the other guy the Dodgers acquired. In the uh, trade deadline. Flurry of activity in late July last year kind of quietly. He was a, a nice pickup 58 games. He had 10 home runs. Drove in 28. Solidified third base that had been a, a problem spot for the Dodgers solid defense. Hey not many teams have their number eight hitter their home run leader. Over the head of Bonifacio and down the line it goes over to get it is Coughlin. 
Blake around first. And he's in there with a double. Yeah, Casey Blake leading the Dodgers with seven home runs. But here's a here's a look at how they're balanced as you watch Blake take care of a fastball in. He turned on it nicely. 21 RBIs Hudson, 27 Ethier, 26 Loney, 25 Kemp, 22 Blake. So a very solid lineup. Of course, this is also a ball club that will be scrutinized for the 50 games that Manny misses to see how they play without him, if they can be as successful without their slugger. Another shattered bat. Well, both pitchers take this a great example of two pitchers that don't throw 98 miles an hour but can still saw off bats because Stoltz has done it and Chris Volstad has. Here's JP who still makes his offseason home here in South Florida. A native of Alexandria Louisiana. South Alabama product where he played his college ball. In the Dodger immediate guy there's a big chunk on Pierre and what he did as a Marlin. From 03 to 05 he played in 162 games in each of those three years. Hit 303 as a Marlin. 354 on base percentage as a Marlin. The Marlins had winning seasons in all three of those years. Pierre had back to back 200 hit and 100 run seasons in and 03 and 04. And how about his 03 season? 305, 100 runs, 204 hits, and 65 stolen bases. Center field, Cody Ross going back. Now where Pierre used to patrol. Still scoreless. And 30 more games to go. Whew. If you're man enough, that's the question. Yeah. You know what? Jorge Cantu likes to play. He has fun. He plays hard. He plays hurt. And he would like to play in this bottom of the third inning. He is scheduled fourth. Top of the order Bonifacio Coglin, Ramirez, and then Cantu against Eric Stoltz. Just when Stoltz gets you leaning a little bit for that fastball away, 
or the changeup or something off speed, then he'll run the fastball in. A low strike, and it's one two. Out of tiny Bethel College in Indiana. A 15th round pick in 2002. You were talking about the Dodger rotation. They've got Randy Wolf in there. Chad Billingsley. Clayton Kershaw, who the Marlins will see on Sunday. Billingsley at this point probably their ace, but he's young. Hudson. One out here in the third. I think for the Dodgers, that was uh, probably the big question mark. We talked about the subtractions from last year. Could Billingsley step up and be the anchor in that rotation? Is Kershaw the the guy that they think he is? The one of the top draft picks, top prospects by the Dodgers, first round pick in 06. And he's only 21. Clayton Kershaw, Billingsley just 24. Dodgers have gone young in the rotation, so much so that their payroll is only a hundred million. I think a lot of people feel, oh, the Dodgers are probably 130, 140 million. The Dodger payroll this year is a hundred million. Part of that is because Manny Ramirez's contract is backloaded, and only 10 million of it is on the books for this year. And they still have some guys under control in Billingsley and Kershaw, certainly. And that's another thing about this Dodger team. And oftentimes you hear people complain about the Marlins for not signing their young players to long term deals. Russell Martin doesn't have a long term deal. Andre Ethier, Matt Kemp. You mentioned Billingsley and uh, Kershaw. Ned Coletti has uh, done a nice job of assembling a, a team that last year won the West. Won the West by two games over Arizona. Of course, the one big name you're talking about their starting rotation. He's been injured, trying to come back from uh, rehabbing right now is Jason Schmidt, and they've paid him a lot of money for really nothing ever since he became a Dodger. Jason Schmidt is in the last year of a three-year, forty-seven million-dollar contract as Coughlin strikes out. Forty-seven million dollars for Jason Schmidt. He was a free agent coming from San Francisco, where Ned Coletti was the assistant general manager. And Schmidt has made just a handful of starts. He made a rehab start, his first rehab start, trying to make his way back from surgery two days ago. Six starts as a Dodger. Hanley Ramirez pulls it. Foul. Our Toyota Trends. Last seven home games. You can see where he is in his career at home. Well, he had that big game, the two home run game against the Braves just before the Marlins uh, took off on their week road trip to Denver and Milwaukee. Things started good on the road trip. Couple of wins in Denver, winning two out of three. See, the last month has felt like one long road trip with a couple of layovers at uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport. <laughs> Marlins came home for a three game homestand and then a four game homestand in the middle of a uh, 29 game span, 22 on the road. And now can settle in 21 of the next 27 at home. Stoltz throws that one by Hanley Ramirez. Both pitchers on their game tonight were scoreless.
know the music, you know the waddle, you know the duck. Fear the duck. Most wins by a Dodger. Oh, I like this question. Sandy Koufax, Don Sutton, Fernando Valenzuela, or Don Drysdale? Good All question. Th the duck must be on the uh, top of his game. I think the duck was a little road weary. <laughs> that one fouled back. That's a good one. Dodger. Well, Koufax had such a brilliant but short career. But but won a lot of games during that short spell. Who else was on there? Valenzuela and Sutton. Fernando Valenzuela, and Drysdale. So three three of those four Hall of Famers. Well, we know it's not Jason Schmidt. And the Dodgers hoping to just keep Rafael Fercal healthy after all the back problems he had last year. Only played in 36 games. And he had a, a terrific start. I mean, he was hitting over 350, had five home runs in those first 30 some games, and then out for the year. And the Marlins know Fercal well. Marlin fans saw him in his many years. In Atlanta, six years in Atlanta. I pop Ugla makes the catch. We check in with Craig Mitterveni. Craig? Hey, thank you, Rich. Remember, it was only a week ago when Annabelle Sanchez went on a DL with that right shoulder oh, sprain. Well, guess what? Freddy Gonzalez is getting a little weary of trainer Sean Cunningham coming over to him. Uh, today was pleasantly surprised when Sean said, Hey, I got good news for a change. Uh, Annabelle threw today, had a little catch game. I remember about a week ago they said he probably wouldn't throw for three to four weeks because of the right shoulder sprain. This doesn't necessarily mean the timetable table be any less than the two months they had said, but it, uh, you'd have to think it's got to be great news, and that's what Freddie said. Great news that he's just throwing today. We thought it'd be several more weeks before he even picked up a baseball. Hopefully that means he'll be back sooner. We'll see. But we do know that uh, Andrew Miller will be back sooner. As uh, in tomorrow, Miller announced as the starter tomorrow night against... Eric Milton who is back from injuries. <laughs> it's John Karanka who will make the uh, start in Sanchez's spot in the rotation on Sunday against we we're talking about the young uh, lefty Clayton Kershaw. Orlando Hudson not in agreement with Joe West tonight. Remember he was called out in the first inning. I don't think he was real pleased at that fastball that caught the inner part of the plate. 2-2. Two -two. Oh, snap goes the curveball. Allstate has given up just one hit. Has two outs here in the fourth. After the game on Sunday, one of our favorite afternoons is dinner on the diamond. Marlins and Dodgers at 110. You can join Marlins players and coaches for an afternoon of fun, food, games, and activities for all ages. Call the Marlins Community Foundation at 305-623-6497 for tickets to dinner on the diamond. Ethier. Ross coming in. Cody dives. Got it. Cody Ross robs Andre Ethier. And a nice way to end the top of the fourth.
by Checkers. Little place, big taste. By the collection, love cards, join the club. By Corona, official sponsor of the timeout. And by Honda South Florida. Visit your South Florida Honda dealers online at sfhondadealers.com for a deal on a fuel-efficient Honda. Scoreless ball game, Dodgers and Marlins. Eric Stoltz floats one outside to Jorge Cantu with Ugla and Hermita to follow. I tell you what, this is a pure lesson in pitching, watching these two guys tonight, Stoltz and Volstead. Stoltz was a Dodger last year, and he's been up with the big club in parts of four seasons. Made seven starts. Marlon saw him. He was two and three. You know, he's one of those guys, Rich, that sometimes you don't take a chance on. If you look at his minor league numbers, they're not spectacular. 39 and, and 44 with an ERA over four and a half. Similar in style and almost in career as well to John Karanka. Karanka bounced around in, in a couple of organizations, whereas uh, Stoltz has been a Dodger for a while. And you're right about similar stuff. Yeah, something about a lefty who can throw that change up for a strike. Keep you honest, I know early in the game in uh, Karanka's start uh, in Milwaukee, he, he pitched inside. It's, it's sort of like pitching in the big leagues is like an ecosystem. If all of a sudden three quarters of the pitchers were soft tossing lefties, they wouldn't be effective. But, but you no, nobody goes out and purposely signs and drafts soft tossing lefties. You, you sprinkle them in, and all of a sudden, those few soft tossing lefties, since you don't see them much, are effective. For call. Figured I'd throw that word out there with the duck schedule. Ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the first time this year. <laughs> <laughs> all right, who are you picking on this one? Well, I, I know, so I, I oh. can't. Uh, that's right, you were a Dodger. I can't divulge my answer. You would know that Don Sutton, that's right, is on top of that list. And mainly a, a longer career as a Los Angeles Dodger. The Don Sutton, uh, a winner of 324 games in his career. Of those guys on that list, Koufax, the guy that you would least like to face? Oh, yeah. He, Sandy Koufax was pretty much for that five-year period unhittable. <laughs> but there are a lot of right-handed hitters who would say they would most least like to face Don Drysdale. Wasn't there a Sports Illustrated cover with Kofax on it that was titled The Arm of God? <laughs> At the knees, boy, you could see the Marlin hitters right now really frustrated. Uglas not look comfortable up there. Cody Ross didn't. Hanley Ramirez has struck out twice. Cantu's popped out twice. Out to short. For call. And there's two outs. The hardest hit ball tonight by Jeremy Hermita, who's coming up right here. And Hermita doubled into the right center field gap. So Jeremy now in his uh, career against Stoltz is two for four with a homer and a double. And he smokes that one into the gap. 
You were all over it, Tommy. Soft tossing lefty. Sometimes a lefty is better suited. Yeah, I've been kind of half right, though, because uh, Chris Godlin has not had good at bats against Stultz. But sometimes that's just a, a guy who's a little more experienced against a youngster. But Jeremy Humita has experience, and he has had two good swings against Eric Stultz. So Cody Ross now. After the Hermita double in the second, Ross flied to left. Boy, Cody made a nice play to come and get that uh, shallow fly ball hit by Andre Ethier. Ethier had a full swing but caught it a little bit on the end of the bat, and that's always a tough play to judge by an outfielder. Sometimes you get fooled by the big swing. Sometimes it's the big swing that that'll do you in against the soft toss. So you talk to a hitting coach like Jim Presley and he'll preach quick to the ball against a changeup or a soft tosser. And you stop and think about it and it makes sense. But it's almost you would think quick to the ball for a guy that's throwing 98. Why is quick to the ball so important against a guy like this? Well, you stay in back. You, the longer you stay back, then you have to be quick to the ball. Talked a little bit to Jeff Conine before the game about that, about soft tossing left-handers. And if you have that big swing, if, you, if you're thinking home run, you're going to play right into his hand. See, there's a, a fastball count. This is how guys like Stoltz can be effective. Fastball count, a 2-0 pitch, and he drops a changeup in there and has Cody Fool. Now it's two and two. And you're not sure what to expect. No, and by the way he fouled off that fastball, he was looking fastball again. You hear guys like uh, a Moyer or a Maddox talk about speeding up a bat and gauging the sequence of pitches on what kind of swings a hitter has early in the at bat. Almost threw that fastball by him. Well, I, I read something years ago. The uh, the winningest left-hander ever, Warren Spahn, 363 wins. Matter of fact, I read a note where Joe Torre caught his 300th win. But Warren Spahn said hitting is all about timing. If you can mess up their timing, you'll have success. Two and two with two outs. The score this game here in the bottom of the fourth. Let's see where Russell Martin wants this pitch from Stoltz. Ross goes down and gets it. Hits it to center. Hits it deep. Kent going back to the track. Looking up. It's gone. Two-run shot. talking Cody Ross got a pretty good pitch from Stoltz it was a change up it was down and Cody Ross went and got it and showed his power Cody Ross about 5'10 change up down that's a good pitch I think Stoltz probably wanted it away a little bit more but it was about ankle high and Cody Ross to straight away center field that's pure power Paulino takes inside. High pop. 
out behind Loney. Hudson says, let me take it. I have three gold gloves. And he makes the catch. Cody Ross battled and battled and then hit it out. And it's 2-0. en español vía SAP y es presentado por KFC. Press the SAP button. Cookie and Raul will appear. Hi, guys. Aquí. Hey, what's up, how guys? How are you? Rich, how are you? Good, good. Happy to be home. Yes, absolutely. Look, look, look. He's eating. What's up with that? Yeah, I forgot. Oh. I didn't I didn't want to tell you anything because last time uh, we had an unexpected visitor. <laughs> <laughs> so this time I wanted it all for myself. Sorry, guys. Hey, Cookie, what are your memories about uh, facing the Dodgers back in the 60s? Who would you rather face? Koufax or Drysdale? Well, unfortunately, I got my first base hit of Sandy Koufax. You know. Unfortunately, that's good. So yeah, that's outstanding. That's <laughs> not bad at all, is it? But both of them, Drysdale was very tough. You know, that sinker ball sidearm he used to throw. And no question, two great pitchers. Cody Ross goes wow. deep. Into center, makes the catch. Hey, Cookie, do you still have that. you still have the baseball from that that base hit against Koufax? Yes, sir. I sure do. That's good. Absolutely. That's good. All right, guys, have a good show. You too, you too guys. All right. Chris Volstad has been given a 2 0 lead right now. Russell Martin hit a ball about 410 oh, feet. But out in the Bermuda Triangle, that's an out. Fastball and a strike to James Loney. By the way, happy to report that Chris Coughlin did get that home run ball he hit. Yeah, that's nice. And apparently the guy out in right field. The curveball was pretty nice, too. <laughs> the guy who caught it out in right field, the professional ball hawk or whatever he calls himself, is not the best of guys. And Coughlin... It took some negotiating, and Coughlin got a little angry at the end there, but he got the ball. Not one of Milwaukee's finest. No. Volstad puts away Loney, and up comes Kemper. Well, I tell you, Chris Volstad has it working, and when he gets the, the three pitches, the two seamers, the curveball, the changeup, he is tough. And the Dodgers are having flashbacks to that game last year that Chris pitched in L.A. He almost finished that game. Yeah, he did. Was it Jeff Kent who came up with a runner on, and there were two outs, and it was a two-run game, and, and Freddie just didn't want Volstead in his first major league start to lose that game. So he ended up going eight and two thirds and giving up the one earned run. 
Struck out six. Gave up five hits. Well, in his minor league career, albeit a short one for Chris, just three complete games. And I think I remember talking to him about that. A couple of them, if not all three, were seven inning complete games. A lot of times in the minor leagues for double headers, when they make up rain, rain outs or rain delays, they'll, they'll play seven inning double header games. Is sharp tonight. Holstead has limited the Dodgers to just one hit. To the bottom of the fifth, two nothing. Man. Uncle Lee. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Yeah, okay. You? Yeah. Good to see you. Last man. time I saw you, I was sitting up there and I said, I ain't gonna bother. Why I, not? Well, say something. No, the season just started. Uh-huh. And you got hit on the hand, but then oh, I found right out you had already heard it. Yeah. Hey, he didn't he didn't he didn't bother me to get player of the week, right? <laughs> the next week. All right, let me go here. Hold on. That's one of the great guys in the game, uh, Lee Elia. Lee Elia. Uncle Lee is he's he's a little bit of everything in this. A lot, a lot of players are he has affected a lot of players around baseball in a very positive way. Holstad takes a strike and it's two and one. He's been a coach at the big league level. Holstead goes down as Stoltz gets a strikeout. The difference in this game, Cody Ross golfing a home run to straightaway center and doing it after the two out base hit by Jeremy Bermuda. Bermuda's two for two. And it was a good pitch, too. Cody Ross took that change up that was down and went straight away. If he tried to pull it, he would have gotten in trouble. Normally, when you hit a ball that low, you do pull it. Yeah, and also a change up. It's hard to drive that far to straightaway center field. Bonifacio runs up to bunt and fouls it. Seven game hit streak for Bonifacio with the single in the first. He's bounced out. I think we've seen good signs in Bonifacio. The defense has been pretty steady. Shoots that bunt to the right side. Stoltz 
That's a heck of a play. Yeah, the only way you're going to get Bonifacio, look, it took first base umpire Rapuano. Eddie wanted to make sure the ball was caught by James Loney. And, uh, you know, he just waited, that's all. He wanted to make sure there was no bobble. Freddie comes out to talk with him. But the only way they get Bonifacio is with a terrific play. There's the catch. Oh, no, wait a minute. I think what he was saying, it was his tag. I don't think Loney's foot was on the bag. Watch this. And watch Loney's glove. That looks like his foot's on the bag when he caught it. I, I think his foot's on the bag. Let's see. Because he tags he him. He catches it right there. His foot's on the bag. Yeah, then right. he came off to get out of the way. And he tagged him on the knee. And Eddie Rapuano just wanted to make sure because it was so close. With Bonifacio running by. He wanted to make sure that there was no bobble in the... Uh, Exchange from the pitcher to Loney. That was a good play by Stultz. That's a great effort, and that's what you like to see Bonifacio do. Coglin takes down low. And it's 2 0. Here's another look. He catches it on the back. Well, he, he doesn't have to tag him. He just tagged him because the throw was there. He was on the back. <laughs> 3 0 to Chris. Coughlin, of course, homering in Milwaukee. Let's see what Chris gets here. Three-one. He hasn't really had good swings tonight against Stultz. Good, good AB. Brings Hanley up with two outs. Tomorrow, Super Saturday, a post-game freestyle flashback concert with Stevie B and TKA following a fireworks spectacular. The Marlins and the Dodgers at 6-10. And fans get a Marlins pom-pom courtesy of New Era Cap. one 877 marlins Not too often over the last couple of weeks have we seen Hanley strike out a couple of times. He waits. Ah. He drives it. It's deep. Off the top of the scoreboard. Coughlin racing for third. Round third. He's going to score. Sitting on an off-speed pitch. Hanley nearly hit it out. We've seen a couple of good swings on changeups. Uh, one by Cody Ross. This one by Hanley. This changeup is up a little bit more. Hanley again thought he had it. He's got a. He's not going to get a triple on this, but he still has to realize where he's playing. I think he thought he had it. It's way out of Dodger Stadium. It's probably out in Denver and in Milwaukee as well. Good running by Coughlin. Big hit by Hanley. So the Marlins, all three runs have come with two out. Can two. And Russell Martin's on his way out to the mound. So Hanley now with a 12 game hitting streak. of those at bats that we've seen Jorge Cantu come up big in two out base hits not trying to do too much just finding a hole and, and getting a base hit and driving in the run Dodger bullpen Guillermo Mota
one and two. Chris Bolstad right now, his ball club has put three on the board. Bolstad is through five innings on just 63 pitches. Cantu, deep down the line, it is foul. All of a sudden in this inning, Stultz has gotten a few change-ups up in the strike zone. The one that Hanley hit, and that one right there that Cantu just missed, hitting a two-run home. That one had a little hook on it. You think Jeff Weaver watched that one with a little twinge of <laughs> nostalgia? <laughs> yeah. He's bad, here. bad nostalgia. He's here with the Dodgers. We thought we were going to see Jeff Weaver in the middle game of this series. But it's going to be the veteran left-hander who had a nice career with Minnesota, Eric Milton. Weaver, of course, gave up the extra inning game winner, game four of the 03 World Series. To Alex Gonzalez, almost in that same spot. Ground ball at short. It's for call. And the inning is over. Two out walk. Then an RBI double. And it's 3 0. Ramirez a two run homer by Cody Ross and so far a brilliant night from Chris Bolstad and Bolstad throws a strike to Casey Blake with the pitcher spot due up next and then Juan Pierre and the only hit for the Dodgers a double by Casey Blake and it looks like it's uh, going to be all for Eric Stoltz Xavier Paul has moved into the on deck circle. Blake gets a hold of one, and the Dodgers are on the board. Casey Blake is the number eight hitter for the Dodgers, but he's hit eight homers, which leads the team. What a luxury that is. Well, it sure is. He had a good swing there. He just uh, went down, got a breaking ball. Looked like the changeup that kind of backed up. But a solid swing by a number eight hitter. He has a five game hitting streak, and he's nine for his last uh, 17, 10 for his last 17. The pride of Wichita State. 
Casey Blake. And here is Paul who was added to the roster when Manny was suspended. He and Juan Pierre have a few things to talk about. Paul is from Louisiana. Not a bad guy to talk to about this game either. Talk about JP's work ethic. How to prepare. Tough to prepare for a good changeup, though, that he just saw from Chris Volstead. One, two. Xavier Paul drives one right field. That's deep. That's gone. Wow. And for Xavier Paul, a one-two pitch that he rides out of here for his first Major League homer. You know, it came after a good changeup. I know Chris wanted to come back with a fastball, but he, I'm sure, wanted to come in with it. Didn't get it in. And it stayed middle of the plate. And for his first Major League home run, he hit one really well. Xavier Paul. Polino stumbles. And Pierre's got himself a base hit. I don't know if he slipped on the plate, but any slip with Pierre's speed is fatal. Well, how many times did we see Juan Pierre practice this and then execute in the game one of the best bunters in the game today? And the Dodgers have a number of guys that can run. No, no surprise. We don't have to tell you that Juan Pierre can. And we've seen teams over the last couple of weeks take advantage and try to steal bases. Look like Pierre was going there. Five stolen bases this year. And again, it's we talk about the RBIs and how they're spread out amongst the Dodger hitters. So are the stolen bases. Pierre with five. For call has three. Hudson has four. Russell Martin has four. He's leaning. Not running. It's a strike. Pierre leads all active players with 434 stolen bases. And since 2001. The closest guy to him in terms of steals is Carl Crawford. And he's 103 bags away from Pierre's 427. He's running. Paulino's throw. Oh, bad. Waiting for him. throw by Paulino that is just outstanding it has to be a perfect throw to get Juan Pierre he's off and running and look where this throw is right into the glove of Hanley Ramirez who was waiting and he had to wait for Juan Pierre and the initial reaction was the ball popped out but that was the batting glove that Pierre was carrying in his left hand. One and two. That kind of uh, stops a little of the momentum the Dodgers have going. So you, you like to see that with the back to back home runs, then the bunt single. But Pierre had a pretty good jump. Holstad's 2 2. Change up back to the mound for Cole can run Volstad. Well, most other runners he's able to get, but 
for call and we talked about the speed at the top of the order for the Dodgers with Pierre for call and Hudson for call can still get up that line in a hurry. If it doesn't trickle away as far as it does he makes a play but for call just beats it. Good effort by Chris does everything right. And for call just outran it. All right let's see if for calls running here. Hudson at the plate. Orlando Hudson has struck out twice. Once looking, once swinging. About the Diamondbacks' fortunes the last couple of seasons. Remember, two years ago, Bob Melvin and the uh, Diamondbacks got to the National League Championship Series. They did it without Hudson. He was injured. Back in 07, missed the postseason. And then last year, while the Diamondbacks were trying to chase down these Dodgers, Hudson was hurt. In September, he missed all of September. Our Firestone leaderboard, National League hit leaders. So who knows? Maybe the Diamondbacks could have caught the Dodgers with a healthy Hudson. Maybe they would have fared a little better in the postseason in 07. Because he certainly adds a, a dimension to your ball club. He gives you some speed. He's a he's a switch hitter. Gives you that gold glove defense. Diamondbacks are here on Monday and they certainly have not responded to the managerial change. I'm sure the way the organization had hoped. Yeah, they're up in Atlanta right now. Atlanta leads that game 3 2 in the fourth. There's the aforementioned Jeff Weaver. Nationals are beating the Phillies right now 4 2. That's in the sixth. Mets are on the coast to play the Giants. Contrasting styles in that game tonight in San Francisco. Levon Hernandez and Tim Lincecum. That's, that's like a heavyweight against a bantamweight. But the bantamweight has the knockout punch and the heavyweight doesn't. <laughs> he's, a, he's a rope a dope guy. <laughs> Trying to keep for call anchored at first. Certainly a guy that Freddie Gonzalez knows well, Rafael for call. They were in Atlanta together. For call was almost in Atlanta this year. In fact, he was supposed to be in Atlanta this year. Here's a 3 1. Line drive over the head of Ugla. Picked up by Hermida. And the Dodgers at the corners with their cleanup man coming up in a one run game. When all of a sudden the Dodgers have put together five straight hits. Here comes Mark Wiley to talk to Volstead. Ethier has hit the ball to center field, and the last time out, he hit it well. Marlins receiving news today that Josh Johnson's shoulder and arm are just fine, and he will make his next start. Andrew Miller back tomorrow night. Eco Calero getting loose doesn't take him too long down there. Boy, how quickly things can change. The Marlins uh, had a nice three nothing lead. Chris Volstad appeared to be absolutely cruising, 
And all of a sudden the Dodgers with back to back home runs and then three straight singles are in business with one out. Bob Schaefer. On and Rick Honeycutt. Rick Honeycutt on the other side. And around Joe Torrey. It's a few years of experience. And really the main thing in this inning has been location for Chris. Ethier trying to lift the ball. Volstead trying to get a ground ball. Here's the good news. Andre Ethier leads the Dodgers in hitting into double plays. He's grounded into 10. One and one. It's been a nice little trade for the Dodgers. Ethier, a, a second round pick of the Athletics back in 03, and he was acquired for Milton Bradley. Here's the 1 1. Fly ball, left center, tagging is for call. Cogla makes the catch. Here comes for call. And the ball goes all the way to the screen. We had an umpire tumble down. Paul Schreiber, who was in the middle of the field, but he didn't expect to be the cutoff man. It almost got him. And this was a little inexperience on Chris Coglin's part. You got to think a couple of things. More than likely, you're not going to throw out for call. He has great speed. Secondly, you've got to keep the ball down to the cutoff man to keep the runner at first base, Hudson, from going to second. And Hudson saw how bad that throw was as the umpire got out of the way. You know, missed the cutoff man altogether, and Hudson now is in scoring position. And here's Russell Martin. I think the other thing on that play, it shows the inexperience at third base of Emilio Bonifacio. Because as a cutoff man, if you know that throw is off, you you almost have to go get the throw. And Bonifacio just kind of stood and watched. I know it was a, a ways away. You try to align yourself with the catcher. So you're in a straight line if you're the cutoff man. And if you see, like you said, that throw going so far in one direction, you've just got to go get it and cut it off. I don't know if he had time, but either way, an alert base runner, Orlando Hudson, was able to get into scoring position. Owen oh one to Russell Martin. Big curveball misses outside. Chris has had to extend this inning, 21 pitches. Remember, he had a nice, uh, efficient pitch count going coming into this inning. For a look, and it's out of Paulino's reach. These are situations where Chris in his brief career has been very good at and that is minimizing the damage and working out of innings like this. Can't do much about the back to back home runs. But if he can limit this and keep it a tie game. He's been able to get out of this. Because the Marlins are going to get into the Dodger bullpen in the bottom of the sixth. Big curveball. I don't know. Joe West maybe thought this ball was high. I think it had the plate. It stayed up a little bit. Not really a good curveball. Kind of floated back over the middle of the plate.
better breaking ball, better results. The Dodgers strike for three. A pair of solo shots. Blake and Paul. And it's 3 3. Cam. Cody Ross, will he get it? Raise it. Yes, he did. Nice catch. The Frostbrook course light freeze cam. That Ross catch ending the fourth inning. Starting the uh, bottom of the sixth is a star cross right hander, Jeff Weaver. Actually spent some time earlier this year in AAA trying to. Revitalize his career. He was actually scheduled, as we mentioned before, to start the game on Saturday, but instead he was moved to the bullpen in favor of the left hander, Eric Milton. You can see that side winding delivery that he has, hides the ball pretty well. Delivers outside, so this is a dramatically different look from the uh, soft tossing lefty Eric Stoltz. Yeah, completely different. He gives you that body turn. He, he's about three quarters. Has all four pitches. A Tiger, a Yankee, a Dodger, a Cardinal, a Mariner. And then last year, he spent the whole year in the minor leagues. A well traveled veteran right hander. Kind of like the sausages getting loose. You know, they have their little locker room area where they stretch. I think those guys are a lot looser than the sausages. Manatees getting loose, don't want to pull a muscle. I saw Tiny out here at 430 stretching and doing some extra wind sprints. <laughs> There's about eight smart aleck remarks <laughs> that I could use but let's move on. Here's the 3 0 pitch and it's a strike. Ugla is 0 for 2. Dan did not look comfortable against Stoltz. You know it's funny as as tough a delivery Weaver has to right handers. Some of the Marlins right handed bats will probably have better swings than they had against Stultz. Let's play by Bo Porter.
three two and it's fouled back Marlins got their three with a two run shot from Cody Ross that was in the fourth the RBI double by Hanley Ramirez in the fifth Dodgers getting all three of their runs top half of this inning Hug was gone to 3 2 on Jeff Weaver. And of course, as we told you a couple innings ago, Weaver forever linked to the Marlins when he came in relief for Joe Torrey's Yankees in this ballpark in 03. Alex Gonzalez homering to left. Ugla goes down, gets a breaking ball, hits it to left center, hits it pretty well. Over is Kemp and Pierre. And Pierre is there. Parents, is your child celebrating an upcoming birthday with Billy's birthday bash? You get one ticket per child, a Marlins goodie bag, and a voucher for a hot dog and soda. Your birthday child also receives a happy birthday message on Marlins Vision. And an autographed player photo. Book your party today, 305 626. Save. Good night for Hermita. The double came in the second against Stoltz, singled ahead of the Ross Homer in the fourth. reason Dan Ugla just missed the home run is that the pitch was down. Weaver made a pretty good pitch on that 3 2. Dan Ugla sending Juan Pierre to the warning track. And Russell Martin wasn't expecting that location. Weaver is 1 0 with the Dodgers, which brings his career record. To 94 and 114. As heralded as he was coming out of Fresno State. Of course, his brother Jared. Jared went to uh, Long Beach State, didn't he? With the Angels. And a good young pitcher with the uh, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Volstad at 89 pitches. If this inning progresses, his spot will come up. All the way to the screen. And Hermita works a walk. And here comes Cody. Yeah, we talk about this often. This is one of those. In game situations, you don't have to worry about as an American League manager. Joe Torrey had a lot of these. But Joe will be the first to tell you early on in his managerial career with the Mets, with Atlanta, with St. Louis, and he well knows the National League. In the American League, you don't have to think about that. You don't have to start worrying about that pitcher spot coming up. Weaver misses with the breaking ball. Watch where this pitch is. It's a changeup at his shoe tops. And for a struggling hitter, that's a big swing. One and one. Well, you always like to see Cody. Get a, a hit or two because we all know what a, a streaky hitter he is. And when he gets on one of those hot streaks, look out. And sometimes uh, hitting a good pitch the way he did with a home run, that'll kick start him. One and two. Mar 
Marlins are 17 and 18. First time they've been under 500 all season long. The Dodgers have the best record in baseball at 24 and 12. And Ross spins around on a breaking ball. There's two outs. This time Weaver even gives him a tougher look, drop down a little bit more, and then threw the slider to it. Kind of a backup slider, but a lot of that uh, success on that pitch was the delivery that Weaver has. Strike to Paulino. Boy, he dropped down a little more from third base on that one. Ross Glode is on deck. Not so sure Freddie may make the change anyway. Even if Paulino makes the last out, he may double switch with John Baker. But maybe not because then he's out of catchers. He had a strike. Russell Martin is pleading his case. Joe West. Joe West ought to have one of those reality show Judge Joe type shows. He'd be good. Uh, he could open the show with a little song and dance. He's a country western singer. Pop up, Hudson goes back, and he flags it down out in right center. Marlins are done here in the sixth, 3 3 with the Dodgers. By that man, the Mammoths. What was it? What's their name? Mammoths. Mammoths. The guys are dance here. They cheer more the manatees than the mermaids. Unbelievable. See, even Jorge Cantu knows that nothing says baseball like fat men dancing.
No, I will not use the telestrator. <laughs> Well, the Marlins can uh, try to squeeze out another inning from Chris Bolstad here. Let's see if he can get through the seventh. James Loney, Matt Kemp, and uh, Casey Blake. It was kind of an interesting scenario with we had the shot of Ross Glode in the on deck circle when Ronnie Paulino was hitting. Maybe to plant a seed in, in Joe Torrey, but at the same time, there was no one warming up in the bullpen. But I think Kiko Calero, who thrown earlier, he gotten up and thrown. It wouldn't have taken him long had Freddie decided to do that. And with Loney on base, Calero pops up and he's ready to go. Boy, and all of a sudden, six base hits just from last inning and this leadoff base hit. And Freddie just doesn't want it to go downhill from here. So he's going to go to that bullpen. A few more mistakes. Guys are picking up. Uh, Chris Volstead better and he's left more pitches up in the zone. So Calero comes in Volstead leaves here in the seventh in a 3 3 game. Here's our called to the bullpen. Now Chris Bolstead leaves after the leadoff single by James Loney. Kiko Calero, who still leads the majors in appearances, coming from the bullpen for the 21st time. Boy, guys like Kiko and, and Leo Nunez and Dan Meyer have just been steady uh, as well as tremendous out of the bullpen. The battle of the bullpens, both clubs have pretty good bullpens. Here is Kemp, who is 0 for 2. Tommy, I think that last sequence underscores what Freddie told us on the last road trip, and that he has to be careful with Calero, the way he uses him. Having uh, the injury last year and rehabbed it into this year. And you, you handle a pitcher that way, not only when he's on the mound, but also when he's warming up in the bullpen. You got to be careful when you get a guy up. How long is he up? Do you keep getting him up? And there are uh, certain situations where a guy, if he gets up two or three times, but doesn't come in the game, then they'll just shut him down for the evening. So Freddie had him up initially the first time, but as you pointed out, felt he was warm enough that if had Volstead come to the plate, he would have been ready in an instant and then come in the game. Yeah, however long it would have taken the pinch hitter and that appearance, he could have gotten ready again. Talked about these two bullpens, the Dodgers and the Marlins. Both pens are tied for the top spot with nine wins each. So something's going to give tonight. Kemp's 0 for 2. It takes outside. It's 1 and 1. Pinto up in the pen.
told you that the Dodgers have the best record in baseball and they have done the bulk of their work inside the National League West. The Dodgers at 24 and 12 are 20 and 8 against the West. They are 4 and 4 outside their division. It's amazing playing that many games early on against their own division which uh, is known around the league not a strong division but you got to win those games and Joe Torrey's club has you never can convince a manager of that right yeah you're playing easy teams yeah <laughs> doesn't work that way Kemp went after the slider and it's two and two many thought the East would be the beast in the National League this year and while it still may be there's the West standings. You can see the Giants are two over and everybody else way back. Way back and probably will not catch the Dodgers. So if you look at it that way, it's the Giants and the Dodgers right now. Here's the 2 2. Remember last year, Arizona had that. Fast start and then faded at the end. And everybody thought well, there's no way they're going to catch the Diamondbacks. But the Dodgers are so talented, more talented than the Diamondbacks of last year. When Casey Blake is your number eight hitter and he's hit eight home runs in mid May, that's a pretty good lineup. Yeah, the closest division in that central you've got four teams within a half game of each other Milwaukee St. Louis Chicago and Cincinnati big jump and ball four and this is starting to get sticky here Number 23. here is Blake and here was the first run for the Dodgers. Blake steps out. Casey Blake has been in the big leagues for 11 years now. Toronto, Minnesota, six years with Cleveland. Kind of an interesting career when you look at his path and how he he got to the major league. He was, he was put on waivers and claimed three different times. Coming up in various organizations. Now there is a major league veteran, Mark Loretta. A couple of veterans off that Dodger bench, Loretta and their backup catcher, Brad Osmus. Those guys have got to have 35 years of service. Well, you have that, and then I was talking to a couple of other guys before the game. They have on their staff as kind of a liaison between some of the coaching, Mark Sweeney. 175 career pinch hits. They also have, and they've had for years, Manny and Moda, 150 career pinch hits. So if you need to talk pinch hitting, you just go to those two guys. Manny Moda was an extraordinary pinch hitter, as you see uh, Brent Leach in the bullpen. And he did it in an era similar to yours where they didn't have batting tunnels and they didn't have places where you could go warm up stay loose. Maybe get some live hitting during the game. The slider uh, nice pitch. 
Manny Mota in his 30th season as a coach for the Dodgers. Kiko Calero puts Casey Blake away. Look at that late breaking slider. He thinks it's in the strike zone by the time he commits to swing. Well out of the zone. A good pitch. Boy, another guy who has had just a terrific career. Mark Loretta. This is his 16th year in the big leagues. 37 years old. He had one of his best years just a, a few years ago in 2006 with Boston. He was an all star for the Red Sox that year. And he enters this season or entered this season a career 297 hitter. I tell you the number I saw that really stood out to me in, in looking at some of the ones on Loretta in his long career a 312 career average with runners in scoring position so he's always been clutch. Trying to pick at that outside corner with the slider Loretta won't bite. And West won't call it a strike, so Calero's falling behind two and one. <laughs> See if Loretta's patience gets him a fastball. Loney out there at second. Kemp is at first. Still not a strike. Boy, he, he can't get Loretta to chase it, and he can't convince Joe West it's a strike. Just off the plate. Very good patience by Loretta. That's what all those years in the big leagues will do. See if he throws him another slider. Nope, he missed with the fastball. There are times where Calero has better control of the slider than his fastball, and this might be one of those. Freddie comes out with the bags loaded. And one out. Pinto in the bullpen. Pierre is the hitter. And the Marlins are going to make a double switch. Well, let's see what Freddie does. Remember, Ronnie Paulino made the last out of the inning. He could bring in John Baker. So.
Chris Bolstad started the inning, gave up the single to Loney. A strikeout and a couple walks for Calero, and here is Pinto now. And they need him to get Juan Pierre. Well, and they need him to throw strikes. And there's the double switch that we thought might happen. Alfredo Omezga comes in. He'll play center and bat in the ninth spot. Pinto bats in Cody Ross's spot. But no margin for lack of control here in this situation with the bases loaded. That's a strike to Pierre and some pressure certainly on Paulino because Pinto has been known to bounce a changeup or two. And a tough guy to double up in Juan Pierre. Boy, no kidding. Corners creeping in. That's down and it's one and one. Loney against Volstad single. Kemp and Loretta walked against Calero. Into right field, that's a base hit. Scoring is Loney. Kemp around third, he will score. And the Dodgers have two. Juan Pierre strikes in the seventh. Yeah, the unfortunate thing, the fourth run is charged to Chris Volstead. Kemp coming in to score, that's charged to Kiko Calero. But you know that Juan Pierre is going to make contact. Tough to strike out. And he finds that hole on the right side and with good speed on the bases, Loney and Kemp both score. Now another guy who's tough to double up for call with runners first and second. And this game is starting to feel a lot like the road trip with games in Colorado and then in Milwaukee. Milwaukee especially where the Marlins would jump out to a lead. They were on the board first yesterday. And lost five to three. We're up four one on Wednesday and lost eight to six. Well, up three nothing here tonight. They have a three nothing lead Tuesday night. Lost six to three. This pair is matched up a few times, of course, for Call and his uh, time with the Atlanta Braves. And for Call is three for four with a double against Raniel Pinto. Two and one. It's got to be a helpless feeling knowing that the guys out on base are your runners. Calero has been so good this year. He hasn't had to, to sit and watch stuff like this. Well, and as helpless for Chris Volstead, who had to sit and watch as uh, James Loney came in to score. Remember, Loney led the inning off with a single off Chris. Two two. Loretta, Juan Pierre, Chopper over the middle, Hanley on the first in time. That Joe Torre having the uh, runners move, pretty good speed out there, and because of that, keeps out of the double play. If they're not on the move, Hanley is able to step on second, throw over the first. Here's Hudson now. Hudson's one for three. Oh. 
Hudson out of Darlington, South Carolina. Carlos Tosca had a chance to manage Hudson in Toronto. You know, 05 through 07, we talked about his three gold gloves. Not only did he win gold gloves, he was number one in the fielding Bible. In fact, had he not been hurt last year, he may have won both those awards instead of Brandon Phillips. Hard to take it away from Brandon Phillips, though. He was pretty good too last year. Tight corner. Good fastball to really set him up for the next pitch. He can go back in there, or Pinto can use that good changeup to try to get Hudson well out in front. Center field. Remember, that's a Mezga now. And he makes the catch, but the damage is done. The Dodgers take the lead with two in the seventh. And setting down the Dodgers on just one hit early. The problem Eric Stoltz was doing the same thing until he got a change up to Cody Ross, who took it to straightaway center field for a two run shot. Hanley Ramirez with a double off the wall, bringing in another run. Things looked good for the Marlins, 3 0 at that time. Casey Blake took a pitch that was down and took it out off Chris Volstead. Xavier Paul, the pinch hitter, a line drive, his first career home run as a major leaguer. And Juan Pierre with a base hit to the right side, driving in two runs, and the Dodgers have a 5 3 lead. Let's go down below to Craig Mitterveni. Craig? Thanks, guys. Chris, I know it's a tough finish for you. It was a great start. What was the difference there? Yeah, I felt good at the beginning. Uh, I think I just patterned out too much. You know, too many of the same pitches in the same situations, and, uh, you know, they were sitting on them and, and put good swings on them. It's a game of adjustments, too. And uh, did you feel like they made adjustments more than your pitches were in a bad spot? Yeah, they made adjustments, you know, that third time through. Uh, you know, just give them credit. Uh, just got to make better pitches. First uh, five innings, talk about what was working well for you. Uh, I was keeping it down, getting ahead, and then uh, my changeup was big tonight. Um, 
you know, I used my curveball every so often, and, and when I threw it, it worked well, but mostly fastball changeup. Thanks, Chris. Yep. All right, guys. All right, thanks to Chris Volstad. The Marlins have Alfredo Amezigo off that double switch. He's in the nine spot, so he leads it off with Bonifacio and Coughlin against a tall lefty coming out of the Dodger bullpen. Yeah, a guy who just uh, was called up recently, made his major league debut on May 6th. Called up from double A. Brent Leach throws strike one to a Mezzigan. in his eyes certainly you want to try to get something going in the seventh or eighth innings because in the ninth inning the Dodgers have their big guy Jonathan Broxton who has been just tremendous he did give it up the other day in Philadelphia but on the year Broxton has incredible numbers. Mezuga goes down swinging. Coors Light introduces the new 12 ounce cold activated can. Frost brewed Coors Light, the world's most refreshing beer. Bonifacio. Just try to get on base. Get on base, bring that tying run to the plate. Leach, and he's gone to the rosin bag a lot. The last few pitches that he's thrown, you can almost see the, the rosin come off the ball as it comes out of his hand like a, a puff of smoke. Yeah, he used to be a famous uh, Gaylord Perry. You see that? I mean, that, that, that should be illegal. Yeah, Gaylord Perry used to call it his puff ball. I mean, <laughs> it's just like a big plume of smoke. And the ball comes out of it. Watch he, this. The knees. He started a Mezaga 2 0. He goes to the rosin bag again. And he doesn't really wipe his hand off. He just. Let's see if we see the uh, puff of rosin. Yep. And it's it's up to the hitter to complain. I mean, if unless a hitter complains, he'll keep doing it. He's got rosin all over his head. <laughs> Look at the back of his cap. <laughs> Counts full. Out of Mississippi into Delta State. Something have, having not seen him before, the Marlins uh, should take note of and make a suggestion to the umpiring crew. And I would expect too for the Dodgers getting into this humidity, he's probably having a. a, a and this may not be part of his act every time out. We haven't seen him, so it's tough to know. Bonifacio well, shoots that one right field line, right field corner, and he's going to run a bit into the corner goes Ethier. Bonifacio flying around second. And he's in with the triple. <laughs> he can fly. Boy, as soon as he saw that ball go down the line, get into that corner, triple all the way for Botafacio, his second three base hit this year. It is fun to watch him run. And Ethier, the right fielder, you know that as well. There's no sense rushing to get it back in because Bonifacio over his shoulder, all he needed was one peak. Helmet comes off, doesn't even need to slide. And another two hit night for Bonifacio. And it's Coglin who's going to face this lefty. And I wouldn't be surprised if they've faced each other at some point in their collegiate careers. 
Maybe a midweek game. Yeah, Delta State and Ole Miss. That was a cold strike. And it's 0 and 1. And he's still throwing that puff ball. Yeah, he is. It, it starts to get annoying after a while. I guess we can see it better and pick it up better than the hitters. And obviously, it didn't bother Bonifacio. No. <laughs> Boy, look at the back of his hat. I mean, he goes to it every time. Every time. Hey, and it's not human. Whitley pitches if he, he won't because they don't come back. But if the Dodgers came here in July and August. One and two to Coglin. Breaking ball. Coglin stayed on it. Boy, this is important to get this run in after the one out triple. The infield is back. Chris Coglin has fallen behind, but he's just trying to make contact. He gets a ground ball out to the right side to shortstop. The Marlins can pick up a run, and I guarantee you Bonifacio is going on contact. Here's the one two broken bat. He got the run home. That's all you got to do. Sometimes it isn't pretty, but it gets the job done. You just make contact to strike out there. You get nothing. So good job. Well done by Chris Godwin. Because he got himself in a tough situation behind in the count. But the ground ball there goes Bonifacio on contact and it's a one run game. Joe Torre comes out. He'll get the ball and maybe call for a new rosin bag as well. He wore that one out. <laughs> Here's our Baruni called to the bullpen. When you need a car. Starts Hanley off with that slider. His numbers this year. He takes over for Brent Leach. Marlins have a run, but are down one in the bottom of the seventh with two outs. Rosario with one of those loose fluid motions. Good live fastball on that last pitch. High, high fly ball. Ethier makes the catch. They'll have to settle for a run. 
down by one. By four. Register for May 19th through the 11th to win a 2010 Ford Mustang V6 convertible, ultimate Florida baseball weekend getaway, or $100 gas cards. Visit FLALottery.com for details. This is the Mustang Money card. Well done. Well done, Rich. What if we win? Are we eligible to win? There, there's a, a list of stuff on the back. Friends and family are you, eligible to you, win. Usually we're not eligible. I think we are. We have no affiliation with uh, with the uh, Mustang money, folks. I, I think let's uh, let's get Cassie to scratch off the deal. Yeah, go ahead, scratch it off. See what we win. Cassie, our floor director right now, scratching feverishly to see if we win. What did we win? Well, you got to read the directions first. They're on the back where it says we're eligible. Ethier takes strike three called and Pinto gets a punch out. Ethier's not real happy. Don't cross the long arm of Joe West. Now you don't want to get the Joe West scowl. No, because he's an old school umpire. He'll, he'll carry that with him for a while. Good job though by Pinto. To start things and again keep it a one run game. The biggest hit for the Dodgers, though, was a, a single that drove in two runs off Raynell Pinto by Juan Pierre. <laughs> Russell Martin. Pinto gets in on him with a fastball. Can two makes a catch. Time now for the stay in the game hold of the day. Brought to you by Just for Men Hair Color. Career holds. Current Marlins. Pinto and Lindstrom atop the list. Just as middle relievers keep their team in the game, you two can stay in the game with Just for Men Hair Color. 20,039. The attendance tonight. James Loney. Hopefully, nice crowds on this uh, beautiful weekend. Tomorrow, of course, uh, a 6 10 start on Super Saturday.
James Loney a first round pick. Back in 2002. Sends that one into center field his second hit. And it was his hit that started the two run seventh. Yeah, Loney had been kind of quiet with the long ball, but just recently in the last few days hit a couple of home runs. Frey's going to go to the bullpen with the right hander Kemp do up Leo Nunez into the eighth. Armaruni called to the bullpen. When you need a car, truck go. Done with the glove and with the bat. A two run homer after the dive in catch. Check out the new R Performance vehicles at your local Jaguar dealer. Or on JaguarUSA.com. Leo Nunez. Meet Matt Kemp. Well, Freddie making the uh, chance to get the righty righty with uh, Nunez facing Kemp. And again, every time we show you numbers, super numbers by Leo Nunez. Good fastball slider changeup. We've seen that all year. Righties are hitting just 080. Two for 25 against Leo Nunez. If you haven't seen Nunez before as a hitter, the surprising thing is you, you are fooled by his size and by the velocity of his fastball. By the way, we came up empty on the $250,000 Mustang money. But we'll play again. Still 0 and 2. The Marlins really have to treat this game like a, uh, almost like they're in front with their bullpen, with Nunez pitching in the eighth. And Matt Lindstrom needs some work, so expect to see him in the ninth, regardless of what the fish do in the bottom of the eighth. We haven't seen Matt Lindstrom since uh, Denver six days ago. Slow roller, Hanley. Nope. Well, 
Boy, a great changeup. He had Kemp fooled. The little tapper squibbed off the mound. And then the only play for Hanley was to barehand and throw hard. He did. And still could not get Kemp, who runs well. Now a tough out. Casey Blake. The Dodgers had one hit through five innings. That was their tenth hit. So they've had nine hits the last two two and two thirds innings. Blake has been a force in the eighth spot tonight a double and a homer. certainly can't let this in and get out of hand here. Couple on, a couple out. <laughs> Chopper, Bonifacio, Ugla, and Leo Nunez gets out of trouble. Marlins need a run into the bottom of the eighth. Fox Baseball Saturday returns tomorrow. Grady Sizemore and the Indians head to St. Pete to take on Evan Longoria and the Rays, the Mets, and the Giants in San Francisco. Fox Saturday Baseball presented by Taco Bell. Four o'clock on Fox. Check your local listings for games in your area. 5 4 in this game, bottom of the eighth. Ronald Belisario stays in there. Well, he got the Hanley to end the seventh. And Joe Torre didn't have to make any moves, so he leaves his heart throwing right hander out there. Cantu, Ugla, Hermita. Good trio coming up here in the eighth inning to try to get something going. The pitcher spot is due up fourth. Remember the Marlins in that double switch. And Amezga come in for Cody Ross, but there's plenty of bats on the bench. And there is Lindstrom, not a surprise. Belisario's fallen behind 2 0. And that's way up. 
It's 3 0. I guess the question for Joe Torre now is can they get to Broxton? This is that eighth inning bridge that drives managers crazy. Don Mattingly in there as well, the hitting coach for the Dodgers. Look out. Up and in, and Cantu is aboard, and the Marlins have a start here in the eighth. I always love it how fans will boo on a pitch like that, but it's a 3 0 pitch. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and it just walked him. And, and Cantu represents the tying run. Yeah. All Belisario is trying to do is throw a strike, and he didn't even come close to Cantu. But well, we saw Wade down in the bullpen loosening up. Yeah, he's probably ready because he, he sat down for a moment and then he got back up and not taking him too long. Rick Honeycutt, the pitching coach. Think of all the years Joe Torre used to bounce his suggestions off Don Zimmer He's sitting on that Yankees bench. Here's ugly. Dan tonight 0 for 3 has flied out twice and bounced out. Belisario not feeling real comfortable right now. That he may have just been uh, stalling. Either that or Joe Torre doesn't like the body language, yeah. doesn't like what he sees. And I think you saw him talking to uh, to Rick Honeycutt. I think they realized that, that they have Corey Wade ready. And you saw how badly Belisario missed on the pitches to Jorge Cantu. So Belisario comes out. In comes Wade. One run game. Armaruni called to the bullpen. When you need. Brought to you by Home Depot. Juan Pierre has stolen a lot of bases, but not here tonight because Ronnie Polino threw him out. The Home Depot doing more on defense. And that crowd starting to get a little active with the Corey Wade coming in. And Wade will face Dan Ugla with Jorge Cantu at first base. Good changeup, curveball, fastball from Corey Wade. And Joe Torre hoping more strikes than he saw from Ronald Belisario. Got to feel a little odd for Ugla, who has seen two pitchers in this at bat, though this is the first one to the plate. Yeah, there's that big curveball. Yeah, Wade spent a little time earlier this year on the disabled list with some uh, shoulder tendonitis.
Can't use it first. It hit him, and he pulled the bat back. And so Ugla is on his way down to first. Joe Torre is going to come out. If Ugla bunts at the ball and it hits him, it's a strike. And I, I thought it was just interesting, number one, that Dan Ugla was up there trying to sacrifice. He was. Oh, wait a minute. They're going to overrule this. The first base umpire, Ed Rapuano, has said, and he didn't bunt at the ball. He was pulling back. Ed Rapuano. No, Eddie, he was not. Eddie Rapuano is a good umpire, but I think he missed that call. He said, Freddie said he hit him, but Ed said, no, he bunted at the ball. But no, he didn't bunt at the ball. He clearly pulled the bat back as it caught him on the arm. And now Joe West joins the, the discussion. And, and Joe's just going to say, hey, look, Ed Rapuano, the first base up, has a better view and angle than I do. It's up to him. You can see by what he's saying is that Dan Ugla well, punted at the ball, but he didn't. I think what, one of the things that may probably have upset Freddie the most is Joe West did not ask for the appeal until Joe Torrey came out and asked him to ask for the appeal. Normally that's done within a second or two on a check swing or a play like that, and it's the catcher that asks. A little intimidation on Joe Torrey's part to Joe West. Here's another look. He's there. He brings the bat back. He's it never bunted at the ball. Comes back. He comes back. And it hits him. And so Tory comes out. Did, well, they, did they throw Freddie out of the game? Because uh, Joe West right now is writing something down. So Ugla's at the plate. The count's 0-2 now. Cantu's at first. And the ball's in the dirt. Martin got a piece. This was uh, Freddie as he went off. And it looks like he has been ejected. So Freddie on his way out. Carlos Tosca now in charge. Certainly Freddie will be in close. Contact. Here's the one two. Change up, got him. Ugla snaps his bat. And he has a right to be upset. And he has a right to be upset at Rapuana. Ugla's yelling at Rapuana right now. Danny better be careful. Yeah, he don't want to get thrown out now either. He can be upset, but you can't get thrown out here. scenario you're right usually the home plate umpire will immediately go to the first base umpire and ask West made the call and didn't ask until Torrey came out have you ever seen on a check swing where the home plate umpire calls it right away and the batter goes down to first where a manager will come out and ask for an appeal and get that appeal no <laughs> I mean, if Joe West is uncertain, as soon as Russell Martin turns around and asks, you either ask for help or you don't. On the other hand, good gamemanship on Joe Torrey's part. Oh, absolutely. To go out and see if he would ask. Meet us two for two. Well, we saw a lot of big curveballs to Ugla. Wade got him on the changeup.
fastball and it's fouled back and the count now two and two. There's Wes Elms. But realized that if he missed it, it would be a big mistake. Yeah, you have to think about that as an outfielder. If you're going to dive, you have to think of the situation of the game. Some good swings tonight by Jeremy Hermita. His third base hit, a double and two singles. There's the thought of Ethier. And Jorge Cantu had to pause because he has to make sure that ball drops in front of the right fielder. So it's Wes Helms now who comes to the plate. Cantu's in scoring position. Hermita's at first. Those are the, the season numbers on Helms, but not the most important numbers in this situation. Helms, as a pinch hitter for the Marlins, is six for 13 with three RBIs. He sees the curveball first. And going with the hot hand because you have lefties in Baker and Claude. But Wes Helms has just been tremendous off the bench. Though that name Mark Loretta on that list. Ball's inside. And it's one ball and one strike. Fourth reliever to work for Joe Torrey. Weaver, Leach, Belisario, and now Wade. That is outside. And he's seen this is this is what West does so well. He's seen all three pitches now. He's seen the curve. He's seen the fastball. That last pitch, the changeup. That's a great stat. Seventh inning or late. And Helms close to 350. <laughs> That's in, and it's three and one. Boy, if ever there was a club that was in need of a feel-good comeback win, it's the Marlins right here and right now. You have Rodney Paulino on deck, but also John Baker with nobody warming up in the Dodger bullpen. See what he gets three and one. Fastball and he popped it up. Hudson infield fly rule and a big out for Corey Wade. Well, and got a pretty good pitch to hit too. So out pops Baker. Baker will hit for Paulino. You see Carlos Tosca in the background there, running the club in Freddie's absence. Though you can bet Freddie isn't far away. And we've talked about it. Some some managers like to just totally get away from it, go back into their office. Uh, some like to have their hand in it still. Go back in the runway, just out of sight. Baker sees a breaking ball, miss low. And it's one and all. Good numbers there. Two walking, and then a controversial call when Dan Ugla squared to bunt, pulled back, and was hit by the pitch. 
originally ruled a hit batsman. It was then overruled when Joe Torre came out and asked for an appeal. That's down low. Makes 3 and 0. Ugly would strike out. Hermita would single. Helms had a 3 1 fastball and he popped it up. The Mezica waiting on deck. And two outs here in the bottom of the eighth. There's a strike. So Baker should get a pretty good pitch to hit. Depends on how much confidence Wade has in that changeup. But you need to sit and look for fastball. Fastball missed down low. They are loaded. Here comes a Mezigo. And that fastball didn't miss by much. A little bit low. Now you get the uh, tying run at third and the potential go ahead run at second. Certainly a smaller strike zone. But the exchange is a less patient hitter than Baker. Yeah, you would think Alfredo would be a high on base guy, very patient, but he's struck out 15 times and he's walked five. In a big spot here, Rick Honeycutt. Joe West out to break it up. Swirling around here in South Florida. Mezga takes right down the middle. 0 and 1. A better hitter from this side of the plate. about the uh, Marlins uh, looking and needing that feel good type win. They'll take a bloop base hit right now off the bat of Alfredo Amesa. Fastball, fly ball, right center field. And Kemp is there to make the catch. Pitch up in his eyes. And Amezaga is out number three.
some changes out there for the Marlins, so follow along with us. John Baker stays in the game. He kind of has to. He's the only other catcher that the Marlins have. Bonifacio flips over to second base. Helms stays in the game, and he's at third base. And Matt Lindstrom's in. Well, he mentioned it's been a while. Uh, the six days in Denver, the last time that Matt Lindstrom pitched. We thought that Freddie was going to get uh, Lindstrom in a game in Milwaukee yesterday. It didn't work out that way. So here he is tonight to work this ninth inning and keep the uh, game a 5-4 game. So Lindstrom to work. Juan Castro is the hitter. And he fouls a pitch off. 0 and 1 Castro and then Pierre and for call. That one's fouled back. It's 0 and 2. There is big, and I mean big, Jonathan Broxton. Look at the size of those britches. Rich, I'm wondering if Dan Oak was okay. Because if you bring Matt Lindstrom in, you, you would want him hitting hitting down as far as you could in the lineup, which would be where Wes Helms hit. You've put Lindy in Ugla's spot right now, which is going to bat fifth in the ninth inning. And uh, if if Ugla's healthy, you would like him maybe to come to the plate in the ninth inning. You know, remember he was screaming at, at the umpires. I don't think he got tossed. No, I don't think he did. I'm just wondering about the ball that hit him. That's good point too. Remember, he smashed his bat when he struck out as well. Hopefully, he didn't pull a Tulowitzki. A good start by Lindstrom to get the pitch hitter. There's the strike three. So one Pierre with Lindstrom missing inside. Biggest hit in the ball game belongs to that man. The two run single that he pulled in the hole right side in the seventh. Gave the, gave the Dodgers a 5 3 cushion. A little rain coming down. That's all right. Pierre's right at home in this. I mean, he grew up in Louisiana. He lives here in South Florida, played here. Something that South Florida has not seen a lot of in the last few months. Mr. and Mrs. Lowen inside. Coming down pretty hard right now. Yeah, it's one of those. Uh, Fast arriving squalls. To put the umpires in a delicate position here. Minister throws a strike because obviously you want to get the game in, but if the infield gets too wet, you also want to get the tarp on it in time so that you can finish. And right now, I, usually you can see the ground crew down by the tarp. I don't see them, so maybe the radar indicates that this is passing and. Not going to be long, but it's coming down hard now. This can't be a comfortable at bat for Pierre. You're standing in against one of the hardest throwers in all of baseball, and it's raining sideways. Three, two. And Pierre walks.
Now let's see how Juan Pierre reacts on a slow track. Well, Joe West he may right, not have a chance. Joe West right now is motioning for the grounds crew to come on out and bring the tarp with him. This one, I think, caught everybody by surprise. Yeah, I think the ground crew was caught by surprise. Usually they're right on top of their game. They're a little disoriented right now. But, you know, the rain is, is letting up right now, and the umpire is conferring with the. With, uh, they're going to go look at the radar. You suspect, and I think you're right, your instincts are this uh, grounds crew and the people here are the best in baseball at knowing when the rain's coming and how hard it, it's coming in. And they were not at the ready, so either they got surprised or they didn't think that this would be significant enough to stop the game. And there's a good chance by the time they get the tarp on, it could be lot lighter it already is raining lighter than it was or it could stop altogether the so welcome to South Florida crowd crews doing a nice job we're gonna go back to that eighth inning sequence and see if we can uh, discern whether Ugla hurt himself whether he was tossed and certainly the just the whole sequence here now remember there's a runner at first and nobody out Ugla pulls back Joe and, West and, and Joe West immediately points to first base. There you go, points. You got hit. He doesn't ask for help. You know, Russell Martin never even asked for help. Yeah. See, and I am really surprised that Rapuano reversed the call. Really surprised. And that argument and exchange got Freddie tossed out of the game. And then the strikeout. Ugla upset at himself at the first base umpire. And the tarp is on. Hmm. The one thing you saw when, when Freddie went out to argue the call was he pointed at the forearm, which is where it hit Ugla. And I'm sure you, he was reasoning, look, if he bunted at the ball, it wouldn't hit him in the forearm unless he missed it by a good foot. Yeah, I think if if Ed Rapuano sees that again, he may have another thought. But I, I'm just like you brought up the point. You don't see in that case the first base umpire overturn the home plate umpire. You you do in the check swing uh, at times, but not in a bunning situation. Well, it's and certainly the the inning might have turned out the way it turned out anyways. The Marlins might not have gotten a run, but it, it, it was a big call. It would have put runners first and second. And another thing, uh, Rich, we didn't see, and most of the time on that check swing, or in this case, a check bunt, the catcher will ask. Right. And we didn't see Russell Martin ask. All right, we're going to take a timeout. The rain is, is uh, lightening up, so keep your fingers crossed. We'll be back to South Florida after this.
beautiful night here for three hours and ten minutes. And then all of a sudden we get this rain come in and you have to make decisions about the roof. In this situation, would the roof have been closed, do you think, at game time? No, that's, you know, Chris, time? having lived through that in Seattle, it's the umpire's decision. Once the game starts, the umpires will control whether the roof opens or closes, and they would not open it or close it during an inning if they feel it would right. be a distraction to either team. But if you think rain's coming at 10, 15, 10, 30, the ball club might have to, even on a night where it's beautiful, close the roof to start out with. Yeah, or they may make the adjustment and they may tell the umpires, look, the rain's coming. David Sampson has told us that the roof would close anywhere between, what is it, 13 and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So there may be a slight delay while they close the roof. Or umpires in, in places like Houston or Seattle will ask either manager, do you mind if we close the roof right now? Is it Would it bother you if we did it right now? Yeah, like in, uh, in Houston, yeah. because of all the uh, humidity and heat in the summertime, for a good part of the summer, the roof is closed anyway to start the game because then it's more comfortable for everybody inside. All right, let's see how Lindstrom handles this delay now. He's in the teeth of the order for the Dodgers. Yeah, and keep in mind, Juan Pierre's at first base after a one-out walk. Baker's behind the plate. And for call is up. Boy, if, if Juan Pierre can hit over 300 and get on base at, a, say, a 350 or a 360 clip. What a dynamic combination with for call in the two spot. This will bring back uh, the Dodgers of old back in Maury Will's day. <laughs> Maury Will's hitting uh, leadoff. Jim Gilliam hitting second. Where did Tommy Davis hit in the lineup in the 60s? Third or fourth? He had Willie Davis up there too who could fly. One thing about Juan Pierre, he always gets that maximum lead. Okay, okay. Uh, Takes that dive back to the bag. Chopper. Can to. That's a fair ball still. No. It's a foul ball. Yeah, the call is Joe West before it gets to the bag. And the Marlins scramble. I looked at the ball, and then I looked at Joe, and he had already made the call foul. I, I looked at uh, Rapuano, and he did not mirror West's call. But as you noted, if it's before first base, it's the home plate umpire's call. Yeah, but just thinking, looking out at uh, Juan Pierre and, and the Dodgers wow, first base coach. That's close. That's close. If he touched that ball. Pierre away from first. 0 2 coming. Center field. Amezga there. So there's two outs. And the Dodgers with a couple of pretty good uh, infielders at the uh, coaching boxes. Mariano Duncan at first and Larry Bowen, the third base coach. There is Duncan. Yeah, now you mentioned Rich Broxton. Jonathan Broxton had gotten up and started to throw. There's Larry Bowen. And Broxton up again. I don't think it'll affect him too much. Just give him a little extra time. Hudson, who has three gold gloves. Larry Boa won two gold gloves, and if there wasn't an Ozzie Smith in the National League during his time, he might have won eight or nine. Having uh, been a teammate of Larry Boa's for six years, uh, he was every bit a, a turf shortstop the way Ozzie Smith was at Veteran Stadium playing on that fast turf. He didn't do backflips, though. He didn't do backflips, but he could pick it. Got a feeling Juan Pierre is not going to waste much time to try to steal unless the track is too slow for him out there.
Hudson yanks it into right field. Pierre will stop at second. So Lindstrom has given up a walk and a hit, and imperative here that he gets Ethier. Number 16. Dodgers with their 11th base hit. Tough to say if it's all Manny, but Andre Ethier with Manny was hitting 317. Without Manny, he's hitting about a buck 15. I think it goes hand in hand. He's probably slumping a little, and there there probably is an effect there, but I don't know how much. And it's one of those things; it's really hard to figure out. Generally. You would think the guy in front of Manny would be affected more than the guy behind him. And Ethier was hitting for, for most of the games fourth, and Manny was hitting in the third spot. Good pitch. Yeah, it looked like the uh, splitter. See if the bottom falls out of this one. There it goes. That splitter's about 85, 86 miles an hour, and the fastball's about 10 miles an hour faster. Baker on his way out to talk to Lindstrom. Marlins will have the top of their order up to start the bottom of the ninth, and they'll face that man, six foot four, about 295. And that is Jonathan Broxton. Carlos Tosca in charge. Soft little looper, center field, gonna fall, base hit. The throw goes into third. The runner moves up to second. The Dodgers get an extra run and an extra base. Nothing good happened on that. Ethier didn't hit it well, but he hit it in the right spot. And when Amezaga went ahead with his throw to third, pitch jams him a little bit. When Alfredo threw the ball to third, alertly Ethier took off and cruised into second base. Juan Pierre scoring on that base hit by Ethier. And that's huge for the Dodgers. Russell Martin. Dodgers adding on. Something the Marlins have had trouble doing. You go back to that series in Milwaukee, got leads in every game, had a 3 0 lead here tonight, and they've just had trouble adding on. Lindstrom throws strike two. Splitter in the dirt and Baker knocks it down. Well, Joe Torre happy about that extra run. It just makes it that much tougher for the Marlins. 
in the bottom half, and that all happens if Lindstrom can get out of this and get Russell Martin. One, two. Martin stays alive. Another guy who has a pretty good ratio, and you, you look at some of their young hitters. Russell Martin came into the game tonight. 24 strikeouts, 22 walks. He walked more than he struck out last year. He walked 90 times, struck out 83. But the Dodgers add a run in a rain delayed ninth. It's now a two run LA lead. And this was a catch in the fourth inning. Cody Ross leaving his feet. He would later leave the yard with a two-run homer. The Marlins could use one of those right about now. Because they're faced now at the bottom of the ninth with having to come up with two. They're going to have to come up with two off a guy who's been uh, just tremendous this year. Jonathan Broxton, he's listed at 6'4", 294. Might be a tad more than that. But the, uh, the record, the numbers speak for themselves. But he's coming off an outing just yesterday where he gave up a couple of runs to the Philadelphia Phillies. But Broxton on the year, 30 strikeouts and five walks. Batters are hitting 073 against him. So it's top of the order. Let's see what they can do against the big right-hander. Bonifacio's two for four. He's got that heavy sinking type fastball. He'll, he'll pitch in 95, 97, but he can get it to 100 miles an hour. Good slider, and yes, a splitter as well. And with his kind of heat, he's probably going to stay up there. That's what happened to him yesterday. Even though the uh, Dodgers came back and won that game. Bonifacio just gets a piece. They gave up those two runs. The Dodgers came back and won that game 5 3, and Broxton got the win. Waynesboro, Georgia. Where Broxton was a, a youngster. Second round pick 2002.
He bent one. Lodi makes a great play. The flip out at first. Bonifacio throws his helmet. And there's one out. Today has been a rough night for Ed Rapuano down there at first base. I'm not saying he missed that call. It's just been a tough night. He's had some close plays. Well, I'll say it. And he missed it. He missed that call. He's missed two calls tonight. Watch Broxton's foot as he kind of shuffles. His foot's the big one. Wow, it's, it's bang, bang. They're, the training staff is out to look at Broxton right now. Good work by the truck. Uh, he beat him. He beat him. Now, we had to slow it down two or three times, but the fact of the matter is, he beat him. So two calls that don't go the Marlins' way. Well, you know what? To be quite honest, sometimes if it's an umpire or it's a game, frustration comes out. Sometimes you need that. And if you go in the clubhouse as a team and if, if guys are mad, you know what? You want them that way. You know, the umpires are coming over. Somebody threw something on the field after that call at first base. And I think the umpires have identified that fan. Oh, right there. That is, there's no excuse for that. Yes. That's, that's ridiculous. They should find that fan and throw him out and keep him out. But the point I'm trying to make as a team, if you get the frustration level up, in a way, sometimes that's good. Because you get tired of getting beaten down, and so you have to do something about it. This is going to delay the game here while the umpires confer with the security. The umpires feel pretty confident they've got the guy. Can we check in with Craig Mitterveni. Craig? Well, first, uh they thought it was the guy in the white cap who was uh, Paul Schreiber came over and said the guy in the white cap so they went to the guy in the front here but it wasn't him and he said look I didn't throw it so they went back to the umps they brought the police over and they now they're saying it was somebody above uh, the section where I am right over here four or five rows up in the crowd whether they're going to be able to find him or not not sure it came from pretty high so I don't think it came from the first yeah, see, and look at the angle of that. Yeah, couldn't have been the guy down there in the front row. Yeah, but here's Coughlin. Coughlin takes a fastball up. Broxton misses outside, and it's 2-0. and oh. So the, the training staff of the Dodgers did come out and look at Broxton, and obviously with that play where he's reaching, when you're 6'4 and 290 pounds, and you get rolling towards first. As Tommy noted, he's had pinpoint control this year, and now he gets a letter-high strike on 2-0. and oh. And he's been stingy, giving up just four hits in his 17 in the third inning. And that's up. Three and one. That's good patience by Cogman. Need a base runner. With Hanley and Cantu to follow. Three one. 
And it's three and two. More than likely is going to see another fastball, especially with Hanley on deck. Works a walk. Well, you have the guys coming up that you'd like to come up in this situation. Hanley now, Jorge Cantu on deck. Only the sixth walk all year. He has not allowed a home run all year. This is his 16th appearance. Outside, there's a look at that slider. And you wonder if the play at first has done something to Broxton. Well, he had to get over there. He had to get that uh, almost 300 pound body over there quickly. Hanley is the tying run at the plate in the bottom of the ninth. Got the slider again. Just an incredible tear, and that's continued tonight with an RBI double. He's hitting 12 straight. Martin sets up inside. Broxton misses inside. See if he comes back with his slider after missing inside with the fastball. Thinking about a couple of things. You, you throw yesterday's outing in the mix where he gave up two in Philadelphia. You throw warming up a couple of times with the rain delay and then the play over at first base. Coglin's at first. Three one coming. Heat against heat. He went back with the fastball and Hanley had a hard swing, just swung through. Ball got by him. 97. Will he see 97 again? Here's the three two. Missed inside. Here comes Cantu. Well, if it's drama you want, it's drama you've got. Rick Honeycutt out to talk to Jonathan Broxton. Dodgers closer that has been uh, outstanding this year. An ERA of 1.59. A few things to remember here as well. You've got Cantu coming up. Ugla's spot is behind him, and Ugla was ejected. And the Marlins have Ross Lode at their disposal, so that's a good bat to have. Up next, yeah, Ross Glode and Brett Carroll, the only two left on the Marlins bench. And Joe Torrey playing. 
playing with a real short bench of four. He just has Brad Osmus left. This is the first time that Jorge Cantu has ever faced Jonathan Broxton. 0 for 3 with a walk. Coglin's at second. Hanley's at first. Great speed out there. Marlins down a couple. One out in the ninth. Slider, strike. Seventh inning on. Cantu was very good last year and is solid this year. More comfortable throwing the slide piece yes, than his fastball. That might have been what Rick Honeycutt talked to him about. Jorge Cantu this year has had five games where he's had three or more RBIs. He'd like to make it six right here. With Hanley's speed at first, a ball in the gap would do as well. That would tie the game. Dodgers outfield very deep. 1-1. One, one. Slider. Strike. Slider backed up. One and two. He has not seen the fastball yet. It's like Martin may be calling for it here. Nope. Breaking ball. Check this swing. See now, right there was a little decoy on the part of Russell Martin because when a catcher shows up like he wants to pitch up, he's he's calling for a fastball. Now there may have been a mistake. He may have wanted the fastball and proxed it through the slider. See, watch. He wants up. He wants a fastball. And then he set up low and outside. He even looked like he got fooled. So it's two and two. So Cantu still hasn't seen a fastball. Still hasn't seen the heat. See what he gets two and two. Breaking ball. And he was just a little late on it. Another slider. And that was kind of the backup one, too. Yeah. When he leaves it up, it sure doesn't break much. It's it's very hittable. Carlos Tosca running the club. Freddy Gonzalez and Dan Ugla have been ejected. Broxton, by the way, threw 27 pitches in Philadelphia yesterday. He's over 20. He's thrown 21 so far here tonight. Another 2-2 two -two coming to Cantu, who still hasn't seen a fastball. There it was. Boy, see, it. he's missed badly with it. There's a good chance. You can't look slider, but there's a good chance 3-2 he's going to go back to that slider. Because it appears he has more command with that pitch. Coglin is at second. Hanley is at first. Marlins down a couple. Three two coming to Kansu. trying to get Coglin out at second. Yeah, just to move, just to check and see if the runners were moving on the 3-2 pitch. That's the pitch that he has more command with now. 
At what point, if you can't do it, do you sit on one? You, you still can't. The, the, the key, though, is that he's seeing it now. Right. And he's picking it up better. But if you sit on the slider and he goes, goes back to the fastball, you're dead. Another 3-2 coming. This is a great battle. Fastball, ground ball, off of Broxton, who knocks it down and throws Cantu out. Oh, that's a great at bat. He got the fastball, had a good swing, and only because Broxton's 6'4, 300 pounds, somehow he got in the way and knocked it down. That ball had center field written all over it. It had one run coming in, and Hanley probably went to third because of the way the outfielders were playing so deep. Boy, that's just a good at bat. And Broxton knocks it down and stays right in front of him. Remember earlier in the game, Bolstad knocked the ball away and it trickled away on for call and he couldn't make the play. That one dropped right down in front of him. It has not been a night of good breaks for the Marlins. But the runners do move up. And so now a base hit could tie the game. Ross glowed with two outs. Glowed has never faced Broxton. Who was obviously having control issues. The guy that had walked just five has walked two in this inning and was at three and two on Cantu for a while. And he misses on the first pitch. Ross Glode. We know that Glode generally is going to make the pitcher work. And another left-handed bat on deck. The hottest hitter tonight for the Marlins, Jeremy Hermida. One-0 -oh pitch at the corner. 97 miles an hour. Coglin walked. Hanley walked. One one pitch. Yesterday, Ross glowed. In Milwaukee. Hit an off speed pitch and hit it out. Hit it off that facing. I don't know that it's dot com dart. I don't know that he's going to get an off speed pitch. No, I don't think so. Actually, he's seen two fastballs now in a row. So the Marlins are down to their last strike. is done. Broxton labors through it and gets the save. A tough one to lose for the Marlins. The Dodgers win game one of this three game series. That's why they have the best record in baseball. The Dodgers are 25 and 12. Marlins Baseball in Fox Sports Florida brought to you by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% on car insurance. Visit us at geico.com or call 1-800-947-AUTO. By Tobacco Free Florida for information. Visit us on the web at tobaccofreeflorida.com. And by Headquarter Toyota, where you'll feel like you bought from the factory. Located conveniently off the Palmetto and 57th Avenue. Marlins Live is coming up we'll get you locker room sound we'll hear from freddie six four dodgers win it